By making Juneteenth a federal holiday, all Americans can feel the power of this day and learn from our history and celebrate progress and grapple with the distance we've come, but the distance we have to travel. This weekend, Americans celebrated Juneteenth as the country's newest federal holiday, commemorating the day the last of the enslaved in the United States learned they were free. Except the 13th Amendment abolished most, but not all, slavery. It reads, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States. Except as punishment for a crime. That loophole allowed another form of slavery, forced prison labor, to thrive and helped create the mass incarceration crisis we have today. But my next guest is trying to change that. Joining me now is the co-sponsor of legislation to revise the 13th Amendment, Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon. Senator Merkley, welcome back to The Sunday Show. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Good to be with you. So when I saw the announcement, the announcement that you put out about trying to fix this, this loophole in the 13th Amendment, it sort of took me by surprise, sort of like the, the, the fact that we have Juneteenth as a federal holiday. Why are, were you so focused on that? And why must this loophole be closed? You know, a few years ago, I watched a documentary, The, the 13th, and uh, um, we grow up in, in grade school, high school, even in college, learning that slavery ended with the Emancipation Proclamation and with the 13th Amendment. And it turns out that's just not the case. Within, within days of the 13th Amendment being passed, many states were passing laws that made it possible to arrest, convict, and re-enslave Black Americans. In fact, Alabama at one point produced some 75% of its revenue convicting and re-enslaving black hmm. Americans. And these were, these were not crimes that you and all uh, I think of as crimes. These were, these were f fake crimes. These were, you changed employers without permission. You're unemployed, you're loitering, you're speaking too loudly, you didn't mm -hmm. yield the sidewalk. These were called the, in retrospect, later they were called the Black Codes because they were there for one reason, to arrest any black individual at the whim of the state. Of course, that terrorized people. It broke up families. It destroyed generational wealth. It created mass incarceration. And that mass incarceration reverberates even to this current day. So here we have this, this clause that is a source of huge systemic racism right in the middle of our Constitution, and it needs to come out. You know, and, and I'm glad you brought up all of the, those examples um, of how basically black life was criminalized. Um, vagrancy laws are also just standing on, you know, just standing on the street or just standing out in public could get could have gotten you arrested. And that, you know, anyone who wants to understand mass incarceration just needs to go back to that. What's the likelihood of your your loophole getting closed, your legislation actually getting passed by the Senate? Well, it's been a long time since we actually did a constitutional amendment successfully. So it's a very hard path. Uh, but. When I first uh, introduced this idea last year, people just looked at me like I was crazy, like, what? We'd never heard of this slavery clause. We'd never heard of this history. Uh, now I've reintroduced it, and I have a, a, a really capable team, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, uh, Cory Booker, who is leading the effort for criminal justice reform, and the word is spreading. In fact, we now have three states that have repealed the slavery clause out of their constitution. And to everyone's surprise, that's not three blue states. You're talking about two red states and a, and a purple state, Nebraska and Color, Colorado and Utah. Hmm. Hmm. All right, let me get you on a couple, of, um, a couple of other things since I have you and you're a member of the, of the Senate. And you're also on the, on the Rules Committee, if, I'm not, if, I, if memory serves. Um, the Voting Rights Act, the, the, the For the People Act that's going to come to the floor for a vote, I think it's on, it's on Tuesday. It's most likely going to go down. It's going to get filibustered by um, by McConnell, isn't it? Well, it won't even get to the floor. So the motion to proceed to it, so it'll be debate over whether to debate the bill, will be blockaded, mm. which is a huge abuse of, of the supermajority. And you're, you're correct. So I anticipate we'll have uh, 50 individuals supporting uh, debating it and 50 opposing it, but it will take 60 mm. to get to the floor. We don't have that. And then um, I've been playing the sound of Senate, uh, Senator Manchin uh, on, a, on, a, on a phone call in a meeting talking about 
you know, hey, he'd be fine with lowering the threshold for a filibuster from 60 to 55. Does that have any traction? Would that gain any traction if slash when the For the People Act um, fails on Tuesday? So to, to understand the possibilities there, the social contract of the Senate has to be understood. And that is that they can't run over the minority. They get a chance to delay, to protest, to have their voice heard, to offer amendments. But in the end, the minority can't paralyze the Senate. It's the second half of that social contract that's missing. So reducing the number required to close debate, that could be helpful. Reducing it every couple votes, every couple days would be a possibility. That's something Senator Harkin uh, uh, proposed when he was in the Senate. Uh, going to a talking filibus, reversing the 1975 rule change that meant you could obstruct with no time, no effort spent, no show. Uh, that no show, no effort obstruction was perfect for McConnell who wants to obstruct with no effort. And so the, the, the Senate's a deep freeze now. And so going back to the talking filibuster would be another possibility. And, and uh, one more question in the less than 30 seconds that we have left. There's a new infrastructure plan from the so-called G20. You're not a part of the G20. So as someone who's not a part of the G20, is the infrastructure um, uh, proposal something you could get behind? It is not sufficient because it leaves energy on the dock as the infrastructure ship sails. So if there is an understanding that we will do the energy infrastructure to go to renewable energy in reconciliation, then I can probably get behind the first bill, though we haven't seen all the details. But listen, mm -hmm. we have missed every opportunity to go to a renewable energy economy and save our planet from, from uh, climate chaos. We can't miss this opportunity. All right, Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon, thank you very much for coming to The Sunday Show.